was hoping for another chorus of that, so it didn't look quite so bad, but uh, welcome to this Sunday service uh, here at Winterbury Heights Church family. It's uh, wonderful to see you. We're um, looking forward to this morning's worship service as we just focus on Jesus this morning and all that he has to say to us. We've got some announcements that are going to come your way. We've got some self-denial announcements. We are going to be coming to an end of these little video clips that we share with you. But uh, we've got a couple more. And then probably sometime just a little bit after the middle of May around the long weekend, we'll talk about our partners in mission in gathering and uh, make sure that you know how we're doing and all those things. So we've got a video clip we're going to share with you right now. My name is Major Selburn Lang. I am the administrator for the center, and we function here in Kingston, Jamaica. The William Chamberlain Center came about to meet the needs of the populace, right, the communities that surrounding. In Kingston, there is a lot of homelessness, and there is a lot of persons who need food daily. We also have a thrift store that we sell things at a uh, very low, low cost. So regardless of who you are, you are able to come into the Salvation Army and able to get a piece of garment for sometimes $50. We do, we do not offer only clothes. At our center, we offer furniture. My name is German Tatum, and I do Jaina here. Um, in Jamaica, we call it woodwork or cabinet making. There wasn't, um, much money to finish school. Then I start um, doing this with a, a, a guy in my community. I was working next door, and um, the, the, the farmer major invited me, and I took up the offer. When you're working, and you're having fun, and you know that you can get a, a dollar by the end of the day, then less stress on your mind. My biggest joy is just to wake up every day knowing that I will be able to make a difference today in the life of someone. Mission of the William Chamberlain Center is to meet people at their point of need and lift them to a higher standard. So when you come to the Salvation Army, uh, it's not just church, is it? There's all kinds of things that the Salvation Army does, not just in Jamaica and Caribbean, but all over the world. And uh, if you need to know anything about uh, thrift stores, um, well, you should talk to Sue about that because she's, uh, she's a pro. But, uh, and we, used, we actually used to run thrift stores. Do you know that? When we got our corrections appointment, we were in charge of a dozen thrift stores and the jail. Interesting time. Thanks for your partners and mission donations. The Baby Song uh, project really is what it is, uh, continues each Thursday. I know many of you aren't here on Thursday, but if you just take a minute, about 11 o'clock or so, uh, 10 o'clock or so, 10.30 to pray, that's when the conversations start. And uh, it's just a great, great thing. Um, last week, no different. Uh, just a, a great group of community people coming to our place here and, and just, uh, putting themselves in a space that uh, is wholesome and helpful and happy and their kids are there and the moms or dads or grandpas or grandmas are there. Great, great time. The next slide we have is going to talk about, it's going to talk about, oh, the men's breakfast. Coming up at the end of the month, um, you'll want to get your hunger on fellows and sign up on the sheet out in the foyer. The next big event before the men's breakfast, the high tea, which is coming up uh, this coming Saturday, 
I know we've had a lot of big events, some planned, some not planned, but, uh, but this one is a big event. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitating to say sold out anymore because that scares people away. But uh, this one has sold a bunch of tickets and um, uh, it's just looking like it's gonna be an amazing event. Uh, nearly 100 people gonna be here in the building uh, that day, so, um, so great. So if you got your ticket, get it on your calendar. Uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be a, a, f a fine, fine time high tea. Uh, the other things that we have to say, is there anything else in this list? Um, maybe not. Um, the uh, thanks yesterday, uh, Major Doug's funeral yesterday, um, celebration of life and what a celebration it was. Um, and I just want to thank you all for all that you did to kind of pull all the little pieces together. Uh, but then again, just uh, just ask for your prayers for June and for her family in these days as they work through all the things, all the things that uh, that, that they need to. Um, the last thing on my note that I've left somewhere, but I remember it all this morning magically. Uh, I got a call from the area commander a week and a half or so ago. And while I was on the phone, uh, Sue could only hear half the conversation going back and forth, and I was giving details and committing to dates and committing to doing things this by this date, this date, this date. And I hung up the phone and Sue said, so is our contract up? What's going on? No, it's not, actually. So the Salvation Army's asked us to stay another year here, and we're just jazzed to do that, happy to do that. Uh, Maybe you're not as happy as I am, but I'm just happy to, <laughs> happy to serve in that capacity for uh, another year. That's how it is now with Salvation Army retired officers. Uh, we do a year at a time, and if, if a year from now they'd rather we don't, uh, they'll, t they'll tell us, but that's not what they're saying. So we're happy to stay. Um, what he was trying to do was find us some money, and he's always doing that. So I don't know if you pray for Robert Russell, our area commander, or even if you like him or don't, that's kind of where he is in that, you know, echelon of, of uh, position as an area commander. He says, people either love you or they hate you, <laughs> and uh, we don't hate him. We love him. Uh, but he's always waving the flag for Winterberry. I want you to know that. He's constantly letting people know that what's happening here at Winterberry is, is God in motion. So. So do pray for him. And there he was on the phone with me trying to find us some more, some more money to do some other things. So God bless him. We're not moving. We don't move anymore. I'm not moving ever again. That's what I told Sue when we retired. Not moving. Never. Well, maybe to a condo or something. But uh, no, number four, Mellonby. That's where we're going to hang out. So, uh, so great to, to look forward to another year uh, in mission here at Winterberry. I've handed some of the service off this morning, so we got people leading the songs, except for a few of them, and uh, so whoever is leading this first song, it's time for you to, Wayne, come on up. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Ah, you could do better than that. Good morning, everyone. I knew it, I had faith in you. It's so nice to see you this morning. We're going to sing a song, and uh, here we go. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. And when I was asked to lead the song this morning, I thought about the coronation yesterday. Um, I sat for six hours, and I watched every bit because I said, I'll probably never see another one in my lifetime. Maybe, maybe not. But it was the first one I've ever watched. And I thought about the royalty and the pageantry and the pomp and the ceremony and all those types of things and if you saw any of it you saw that too but i sat there and one of the things that kept going through my mind and through my mind was as great of a person as he probably is i don't know him personally how much do we praise our king of kings and our lord of lords and how the pageantry and the pomp and the ceremony as we get to heaven and as we join that. And I thought about Major Doug, who's there and who's, as the scripture says, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord and how great that will be. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm in no hurry, but I'm looking forward to that part 
of my existence and coming and hearing perhaps the beautiful choirs of angels sing. So we're going to be a choir of angels this morning, and we're going to put on our best robe in the sense of, of who we are and, and stand in front of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And as they celebrate it yesterday, we will celebrate again today our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Stand with me as we sing, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. And we'll certainly do that. Band, please. The first, uh, the first two verses, please. My soul, the King of Heaven, Father, like he leads and spares us, well our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, widely as his mercy flows. Band will sing the last two verses, please. Father, like he tends and spares us, well a feeble friend he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, widely as it mercy flows. Angels in the light adore him. We behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before him. Dwellers all in time and space. Praise him There's a scripture verse that talks about how God's mercy and his blessing flow like a river uh, from heaven toward us. And uh, that's really what this song that we're going to share now is about. Um, you've sung it before, so I know that you can lift it up in, uh, in worship this morning. But uh, to the river I am going. So it's about intentionally seeking out that that blessing that comes from him and flows towards us in a in a constant stream, a constant flow uh, towards uh, towards us from his throne. So let's sing this together. To the river, I am going, bringing sin. Just 
song in my head for uh, the last week and so I thought I'd better get it out of my head and out onto the airwaves here <laughs> and, but I, I think it's because this, this song just um, says all the things that I, I need to, to be saying to him in these days I love you Lord, your mercy has never failed me all my life all my life you have been faithful and it doesn't matter if you've lived seven years or 77 or 107, uh, we can all sing these words. I think we're okay, Raj. I think. Fire and 
darkest night You are close like no other Looking like a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, running after me Your goodness is running after My life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so Sometimes it's just uh, in quietness that we need to be. And um, I was um, driving in my old truck. Uh, I had to go to Mississauga. And while the truck is pretty noisy, as you can appreciate, it's old. It's not like driving Sue's car. But in the noise, kind of almost white noise for an old truck runner like myself, the motor noise, when it's not missing, it's, it's comforting, I suppose. But in the quietness of that moment, and I, I don't know if you capture these moments for yourself, but in the quietness of that moment, still with my attention fully on the road, allowing God to speak in those moments, you know what he said? He, he said to my heart, these are weary times for all of us. And I thought, okay, so do I acknowledge weariness? As a congregation, do we acknowledge weariness? Do we actually say, God, yeah, these are tough times. I think we do. And when we do, at least when I did. His presence in that old truck was palpable. I knew he was there. These have been, these have been hard times, harder, harder for some. Bev and June. But I think we say that to God, don't we? We just say, hey God, I know you're there. Oh, be there. Be there. So I thought we'd just quietly sing this song. You know it. You don't even need the words. And remind us that he's there. That he formed us. That he'll never, ever leave us. And just say in front of him, wash over us, Lord, in these days. Sing it with me. I have a maker. He 
transformed my heart Before even time began My life was in His hands He knows my name He knows my end He sees each tear that falls, and He hears me when I call, and He hears me when I call. I have a thought. Father, this morning, we're in your presence. You know us better than we know ourselves. So right from where we are, we call out to you. And we say, Lord, you know our name. You know our thoughts. You know everything about us. You know where we are. You know what we are. You know who we are how we are and in those moments and right at that place will you meet us there will you meet us there we pray amen now Terry and Sylvia and friends are going to come and we're going to share the offering together. There's been a question asked which one of us was going to play the piano this morning. But you're lucky, Sylvia, because I can only play with one finger. And it's usually the same song over and over again, a Christmas carol. So. Let us pray. Dear God, with the world in so much trouble and strife at the moment, we come into your presence this morning. We return unto you part of the bounty you have given us. We ask you that you will bless it and help us to use it wisely to relieve some of the pressures in this world, to relieve the suffering of some of the people who do not know you, who have fallen away from you. Please take our offering now and use it for thy kingdom. Amen.
If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me, please, to 1 John chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 28, and then on to chapter 3. My children, remain in union with Christ, so that when he appears, we may be full of courage and not need to hide in shame. You know that Christ is righteous. You should know, then, that is everyone who does what is right is God's child. On to chapter 3. See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are. This is why the world does not know us. It has not known God. My dear friends, we are now children of God but it is not yet clear what we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Everyone who has this hope in Christ keeps himself pure just as Christ is pure. Whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of the law. You know that Christ appeared in order to take away sins and that there is no sin in him. So everyone who lives in union with Christ does not continue to sin, but whoever continues to sin has never seen him or known him. Let no one deceive you, my friends. Whoever does what is right is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Whoever continues to sin belongs to the devil, and the devil has sinned from the very beginning. The Son of God appeared for this very reason, to destroy what the devil has done. Whoever is a child of God does not continue to sin, for God's nature is in him, and because God is his Father, he cannot continue to sin. Here, then, is the clear difference between God's children and the devil's children. Anyone who does not do what is right or does not love his brother is not God's child. Not my words, but the inspired word of God. Amen.
thanks to uh, all the participants this morning as uh, uh, we've kind of teamed together to make this work this morning. It's, uh, it's really great, isn't it? We can work together. Um, be careful how you read this slide, will you? Don't be deceived by Major Brad Donas. <laughs> Put a little bit of space in between, <laughs> between there. Um, as I was thinking about what we'd talk about this morning and, and, and putting on, hinging it on to last week and, and knowing that we're in this series in 2 Timothy that we're, we're working through to, to try and uh, capture really the, 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 the essence of this letter that first that's, that Timothy is writing to Paul, all right, Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, Timothy was hanging out in Ephesus and trying to build a church, trying to, to create a church. And um, he, he, was, he was encountering some opposition. He was encountering some, some other things. And that's kind of the context uh, that, um, that we, we, we picked this up in. Uh, last week's scripture reading, a little dark. Uh, I, didn't even, I wasn't even brave enough to hand Marie this week's uh, text from uh, from Second Timothy. It's also a little dark, uh, but uh, but but what she was able to share with us, you you heard some of the things in there. Um, some of you know that uh, when I retired, I took on this role of teaching safety. Uh, teaching safety. I've always been a pretty safe guy. You wouldn't know it by the top of my head this morning as I crashed into something this week and cut myself up a little bit, but. Uh, um, I've always been fascinated with safety and keeping people safe when they're doing their job. It doesn't matter if you're uh, up at the top of a hydro tower or if you're in the food bank at the family services. If somebody gets hurt, that's, that's awful. That's horrible. It shouldn't happen. And it can be prevented. And one of the ways that I teach in my safety class uh, is about signs. Who would think that a sign could save your life? But you know what? It can. And the problem with signs in the church, well, number one, nobody likes to, likes to see a whole bunch of signs, right? Uh, signs, signs, everywhere a sign, I think it says in the old uh, rocker song. I won't, uh, well, you know, I tucked my hair up under my hat. I think that's also, so I've stopped singing that. But there's a, there's a sign. But the beauty of signs is that they warn us about something before we get there. Before we get to the hazardous spot, we've, we know there's something going on up ahead. And that's really what a sign does for us. You know, the, the, the thing that we have to pay attention to here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is that Paul gives Timothy a sign. And it's not a sign and a wonder kind of a sign. It's not, it's not all kind of, you know, in the, in the clouds style. This is a sign. He says, listen to this, know this, Pay attention to this, chapter 3, verse 1. Don't miss this. Some of the translators say, don't be naive. That's cutting. In the last days, perilous times will come, he says in First Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1. If I've messed up the... And I know the scripture reading was from First John. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Perilous times ahead. And you say, well, yeah, but, you know, last days. Come on, Brad, last days. That's probably, what, a long time from now. Maybe it's 10 or 20 years from now. Maybe it's like since Jesus was here. Maybe it's a couple thousand years from now. I don't know. And that doesn't matter. The warning sign that was given by Paul to Timothy said in these last days. So from the days that these words were being written until today, May the 7th, 2023, we are in the last days. And the warning sign is that perilous times, hard times, harsh times will come. And last week we went through this list of things, and while I know that you didn't want to apply any of those to you, I asked you to go home and see if any of these apply, and if they do, get on your knees and pray, because God has some work to do in you if any of those, those terms in that list apply to you, because it's up to us to not bring that stuff into our home and into our families and into our church. And they're ugly things. Unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. But you know, the thing that, that, that troubles me the most about that list, the thing that ag absolutely makes me, makes me sweat just a little bit, is verse 5. 
underline it if it's in your Bible, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What Paul is saying to Timothy is these things can find their way into your heart, into your home, into your church. These things, and they find their way in insidious ways. We'll talk about that in a moment. Nobody likes to hear training college stories, right? There's, every officer has a million. This isn't a training college story, but the first year in my first church, here I am, 20-something, and I'm in charge of a church. Who wrote that plan? Like, I, I, was, I was no more ready for that than anything else in my life, but here I am. I had a great group of people around me, just like I continue to have a great group of people around me. You're not on your own. You got people praying for you. You got people guiding you. You got people to, con to consult with. You got people leading. But a phone call came. And the phone call was from my home church where I grew up. And the question from that phone call was Have you seen Jim? call him Jim because that was his name and it would be one thing if Jim was off gone lost somewhere or if they couldn't find him that would be horrible but Jim was the pastor and Jim was instrumental in me coming to Christ and Jim gone off the rails. He'd been doing things that nobody knew. You could attach quite a few of those terms that we talked about last week to him. Nobody knew. I'm a brand new pastor, wet behind the ears, still in formation. I'll tell you one thing, it nearly knocked me off the rails. I had a lot of questions, a lot of questions about this person that I had trusted, person that I would confided in, off the rails. The story is long, but I'll shorten it by saying his family was finished, his marriage was finished, his ministry was pretty much finished. He was nearly finished. I didn't see the warning signs. Should have. Didn't see him missed them. And I think that Paul gets into why we miss the morning signs in this next little bit of text. And if you've got your Bible, you're going to turn it open to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and we're going to come back to 1 John in a few minutes. But verse 5, having a form of godliness but designing its power, from such people turn away. So here we are, given an instruction to turn away when we see those signs. Now that's hard, isn't it? Because here in the church, we've been called to, to let people in, not turn them away. We've been called to come close, not turn away. So it's completely countercultural for us to turn away from people in the church, or anywhere for that matter. And then Paul, and I'm going to go very quickly, gives us a description of the problem. The problem in our world, the problem in our heart, the problem in our home, the problem in our church. And all I did to get through this was to write out some of the key words. And one of the, the first key word that I wrote was creep in. You see, things like this creep in to our hearts, our home, and our church bad influence, the, the, the going of the wrong way. It doesn't come on us like a hailstorm, but it creeps in. I'm sure that if you've ever gone the wrong way, it didn't happen overnight. It was just a, a little by little, and then you find yourself in a place of frustration, a, a place of, as Marie shared with us, sin even, perhaps. And you say, how, how, did, I, how did I get here? You see, it creeps in. It sounds creepy, I know, but it creeps in. I, I, I wrote in my notes, do you lock your doors at night? I'm not talking about the door to your house. Do you lock the door of your heart? 
Do you, do you make sure that what you seal up your life with at night is something wholesome and healthy and happy and godly? You see, it creeps in, this influence. And he talked about households, and I already referred to that. I, I think when he talked about households, for me, it's, am I allowing things into my heart? Am I allowing things into my home? Am I allowing things into my church that just shouldn't be there? And if you need the list, three verses up. Things that, that destroy. And Paul says that, that these influence take people and, and lives captive. They take lives captive. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to be holding up the warning sign for you, but, but I think we have to guard against that in our lives. Because as we heard just a moment ago, we have an enemy. And his name is Devil. And he doesn't want you to grow. He doesn't want you to succeed. He doesn't want you to be wholesome in Christ and whole. He wants you to be empty and defeated. He takes you captive. The thief comes but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what he said. Now here's the reason why we don't read this in, in, in church. Because it says that, that these type of people come and they take captive. Look at it. Do you see it? I mean, gullible women. Now why would Paul focus on women? Well, because that was his culture. And I think we can very, very safely, and without uh, looking for lightning bolts to come out of the sky and strike me, I think we can easily say gullible people. And gullible is one of those words that we don't use so much. In fact, it's, it's rather demeaning. But I think, I think you can apply these words. People who are vulnerable. People who are injured. People who are grieving. People who are Halt. Do you remember that, remember that one? Halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I, I watch for that all the time in my life. That I don't allow myself to get too hungry. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, she's doing great, right? We're, we're doing fine. Too hungry in any way, whether that be hungry that way, you know, physically or hungry uh, spiritually or emotionally. Angry. Keep your, keep your eye on that gauge. Don't allow anger to creep into your life because it'll take you out. Loneliness and fatigue. <laughs> I've added one more and it comes up next, but oh, so I talk about halto. Sounds like I'm speaking another language, but overwhelmed is my fifth one that I always watch out for. It's like keeping my eye on the gauges in that old truck I was talking about. Gullible, vulnerable injured, grieving. But you know what? Those are the people we welcome to church. Those are the people we want in our presence. Those are the people we say, hey, come, because this is a place of hope and help and healing. Doesn't it behoove us to make sure the environment that those vulnerable people are coming into, that you are in, that I am in, is a safe environment where people aren't going to get hurt? Loaded down is the next term. Overwhelmed is what I wrote. Loaded down, overwhelmed with sins, Paul says. Scripture reading referred to it. Sin in our life. Maybe we don't talk about it much in church, but my goodness, we should. We should give people the opportunity to come here to this place among you and me with their sins and, and, and find hope and help and healing and, and, and recovery from those things in their lives. This is the place. This is the place where people should be able to come with those things that weigh them down like a bag of rocks. Because you see, those who are struggling get led away. They get deceived, and there's the sign. Don't be deceived. The enemy would deceive you. Paul says they're led away with various lusts. And I know as soon as we say that word lusts, and I think we're in good company for me to say this is maybe the adult version. We, as soon as we say lust, we think sexual. Well, we don't, yeah, okay, go there. But our lower impulses start to take over. Our worst selves. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, overwhelmed.
Some people call me at night, after 9 o'clock. You know what I've learned? I've learned that after 9 o'clock, it's almost best I don't answer my phone. Because I'm not my best self after 9 o'clock. Now, I'll carry on a, a good conversation with you. And for sure, if you're in trouble, don't, don't hesitate to call. And I'll answer that call. But, but there, are, there are some that, and th they're not here this morning, okay? And I'm just saying. But, but I got people around the world. And so there, there's one, Ronnie, if you're listening, uh, out in Fort Saskatchewan. Uh, he's, he knows, don't call me after 9 o'clock. And it's only 7 o'clock at his house, right? Don't call me after 9 o'clock because I'm not my best self. I'm just not. I'm tired. Uh, I'm done for the day. Sue usually is trying to keep me awake till 10 so I don't wake up in the night. You know the thing. <sighs> we have to be careful, right? We have to know ourselves. We have to be our best self. Not just putting it on. But I know my limits. and You know your limits. He goes on and says, the problem in, in the church and the problem, the problem with us when we're overwhelmed and, and overtaken is that we get to this place where we're always learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Have you ever sat and thought about that phrase? I'm sure you've read it before. Always learning, never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Since the invention of this thing called the internet, people have been learning. Well, at least imbibing information. Soaking in information, 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 but never, never landing it, coming to the knowledge of the truth. Don't you love it when somebody says, hey, look at this, what I saw on Facebook. Isn't this wonderful? Usually it's not. I mean, maybe once in a hundred, maybe, but be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you, what you see. Be careful what you read because everybody in the world now has a soapbox that they can stand on and they don't need to be uh, right. They don't need to be right to say things. So be so careful. Never coming to a knowledge of the truth. So filter, filter, filter. And sometimes, like after 9 o'clock at night, disconnect just shut it off little children verse 7 of the scripture reading this morning little children I know you don't like being called children but when John said that to the people he was talking to it was like a father talking to his kids it was like dada talking to his child and he said it he said, don't let anybody deceive you. Let nothing deceive you. Friends, I know that I'm preaching to the choir a little bit this morning because we've, most of us, been around for a while. But I don't think, I don't think it makes us not vulnerable. We live in a world where deception is, is flows like water. He who practices righteousness, the person who practices righteousness, is righteous just as Jesus is righteous. That's you. That's what God is asking of us, that we practice, that we put righteousness foremost in every, every part of our life. And we hold on to it. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Don't lose sight of that. That is his business. And his business is to take down, not lift up. To defeat, not empower. But the purpose of the Son of God, the purpose that he came, the reason that he came, was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is for us, not against us. There was another phone call. It came just about this time of the year. My grandmother's birthday was on the 1st of May. Her name was May. And the phone call came to our quarters in Georgetown. We'd just been there not quite a year wasn't our first appointment now, it was like our seventh appointment. 
And the phone call said that my uncle was gone. That he'd taken his life. <sighs> that still hits me like a brick. Three hours later, I sat on the back deck with his wife and listened to a story that I couldn't believe. You see, um, I play guitar because my uncle played guitar. I'm an electrician because my uncle was an electrician. I'm a Christian because my uncle was a Christian, led me to Christ. And what I heard in that next half hour, the next hour, almost finished me because I'd been deceived. Friends, don't be. Don't allow deception to take root in you. And if it comes, get healing, get help. Don't allow deception to take root in your home. And we're all part of this church. Let's don't let deception be part of this church ever. Whoever's been born of God doesn't sin. For God's seed remains him, and he can't sin because he and she has been born of God. We're in vulnerable times. And Jesus to be, needs us to not be deceived against any of those influences. Don't give the devil a foothold ever. Let's pray. Father, sometimes warnings are hard, sometimes they're harsh. Sometimes they come to us when we don't really want to hear them. We'd rather hear about happiness and sunshine. But Lord, your word, your word warns us about things that are going on in our world. And we're never, we're never immune from those things. Those things never take a rest. Even when we're weary, even when we're tired, we're hungry, we're, we're angry, those things never take a rest. So Lord, as your people, help us each day each day to live in your presence, to be drawing from your presence in our lives, to be finding that place in our life where we're before you and allowing you to, to speak in and to wash us, to make yourself known to us in every situation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Now, in the quietness of this moment, we're going to sing quietly, softly. We're going to breathe out a song that you know, and I'm pretty sure you know well. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. That I may love what you love and do what you would do. And as we just breathe out these words, let's allow God by his Holy Spirit among us and in us to cleanse us to heal us to to ransom and restore us and to just wash his presence over us in these moments breathe on
a, is a, a discipline that perhaps you need to, and I need to, to, to grab hold of tighter. Just being in his presence, some place it might be in the quietness of your home in that spot where you've created to just be quiet. Maybe it's in the front seat of your truck as you're driving it down the road. But God will be there when you call out to him. And he'll be there until you're wholly his, completely his, until that earthly part of you, that part that's, that's not, so, not so strong, not so, so great sometimes, fades away and glows with his presence. Two verses. Let's just sing them out, breathe them out to him as he speaks to your hearts today. Thanks again, Brad, for sharing that word with us this morning. And there's no doubt about it. It's so easy to be deceived these days. But what we should say, but in our own hearts, is this. I would be thy holy temple. Sacred and indwelt by thee, not then could stain my commission. Tis thy divine charge to me. Take thou my life, Lord. In deep submission I pray. My all to thee dedicating. Accept my offering today. Let's offer ourselves back to God again today. And don't be deceived. Don't pity see what we see and what we hear. God is the answer. Two verses, please. of love, loved ones to bring to thy footstool, thy gracious riches to prove. Last two verses, please.
we might dedicate our lives to you to be used to be a bright light in this world to those who need us thank you for your word this morning thank you for speaking to us through bread we ask your blessing upon us now as we dismiss and go our different ways in the name of Christ